And as you're being seated, I would invite you to open your Bibles to page 1, Genesis chapter 1. In keeping with the opportunity we have uh, with our friends from Institute of Creation Research, this is our sort of Creation Sunday. We like to do this about once a year, where we reflect again on what it is to us, what it means to us, that God is our Creator. And I hope this is helpful for you this morning. Reflecting on these things has been an encouragement to me all over again. And when you think about the fundamental distinction between God, our creator, and what it means for us to be creatures, just at its very base level to understand that I have been made and that God is my maker, those are life-altering truths. Those truths get us out of the realm of the mundane out of the worlds we swim in normally and certainly against the grain of the way the world around us thinks. In Genesis 1-1, the opening page of our Bibles, this word from God, we read these words. In the beginning, God. God created the heavens and the earth. That is, the universe and everything in it. And what unfolds in Genesis chapter 1 is the detailed order by which God creates the universe and everything in it. And he zooms in in chapter 2 on the creation and regulation of man made in his image. When we think about the creation week and the fall of man and a global flood and the dispersion of nations and languages at the Tower of Babel, the first 11 chapters of our Bibles... These historic events explain why our world looks and acts like it does. And the Bible's explanation of our early and very recent history is not accepted by scientific consensus in our day. The Bible's explanation is perhaps not even accepted by most Christians today. Prevailing scientific worldview contends that the earth has been here for nearly 5 billion years, the universe for many billions more, that present geological processes formed the geological features we see around us, that man evolved from primates, and that all of life evolved over billions of years through many transitions and a slow, relentless process of gradual improvement through death, mutation, and natural selection. Most Christians follow the science. That creates a big disconnect for us when we open our Bibles. That is not how the Bible begins. Which story is to be believed? Or is it possible that both stories can be true somehow? Must the Bible's testimony about creation be taken at face value? Did the author intend the biblical narratives to be understood as history? Now, what if we ask this of some of today's Christian leaders and pastors and commentators and theologians, radio personalities and scholars? These men have books on your bookshelves, blogs on your blog roll, and sermons on your podcast. I'm going to read from some of today's Christian leaders, men whom you and I respect, whose books are on our library shelves in this very church. What do they say? I've got their names written in front of me. I'm debating in my mind right now. Do I read the names? I don't know. Okay, James Montgomery Boyce said, We have to admit here that the exegetical basis of the creationists is strong. In spite of the careful biblical and scientific research that has accumulated in support of the creationist view, there are problems that make the theory wrong to most evangelicals and certainly to evangelical scientists. Data from various disciplines point to a very old earth and an even older universe. Bruce Waltke wrote, The days of creation may pose difficulties for a strict historical account. Contemporary scientists almost unanimously discount the possibility of creation in one week, and we cannot summarily discount the evidence of the earth sciences. I think if the data is overwhelming in favor of evolution, then to deny that reality will make us a cult, some odd group that's not really interacting with the real world, and rightly so. John Salehammer wrote, Given what appears to be true about the age of the earth, it is likely that millions or billions of years transpired during this time of the beginning. He wrote, I'm convinced that the arguments not only point the way to a proper understanding of the first two chapters of Genesis, but they also enable us to live in peace with the findings of modern science. And he detailed in his work how evolution and Genesis 1 and 2 could go together. 
Wayne Grudem wrote this in his Systematic Theology. Although our conclusions are tentative, at this point in our understanding, Scripture seems to be more easily understood to suggest, but not require, a young earth, while the observable facts of creation seem increasingly to favor an old earth view. J.P. Moreland wrote, The date of creation is a difficult question, but on exegetical grounds alone, the literal 24-hour day view is better. However, since the different progressive creationist views are plausible, or they are plausible exegetical options on hermeneutical grounds, then if science seems to point to a universe of several billions of years, it seems allowable to read Genesis in this light. Millard Erickson, also the author of A Systematic Theology, wrote, At present, the view which I find most satisfactory is a variation of age-day theory. There are too many exegetical difficulties attached to the gap theory, while the flood theory, that is the biblical face value view, involves too great a strain upon geological evidence. James Montgomery Boyce wrote, We have shown the possibility of God's having formed the earth and its life in a series of creative days representing long periods. In view of the apparent age of the earth, this is not only possible, it is probable. Nothing is to be gained by insisting that God had to create all things in six literal 24-hour days. Dr. Sproul wrote, although I tried to follow this argument through his lifetime, I believe he changed his view. But in 1996, this was Dr. Sproul. Certainly, Genesis indicates that there were, two, that there were steps or stages in creation. The debate is over the time duration of each step. To be sure, the word yom or day is almost always used to refer to 24-hour period, so the prima facie indication would be the same in Genesis. My concern is that the literary structure may indicate something else. I have been open to an old earth view because the Bible makes no claims about the date of creation. Dr. Dobson, his private opinion as a layman with no training in the physical sciences, leans in the direction of a moment of creation that may have involved a Big Bang type of episode. Whether that occurred 6,000 years ago or 4 billion years ago or within a span of six literal 24-hour days, he doesn't know nor is he comfortable with those who claim without qualification that they do know. D.A. Young wrote, Continued promotion of the ideas of young earth and six-day creation will, in the long run, damage the credibility of Christianity and thus hinder our evangelistic and apologetic methods. John Piper said on the age of the earth, Whatever science says, that's what it is. Mark Driscoll said, this may mean that God created the earth over an indefinite period of time that could have, in fact, been billions of years ago. This would explain the apparent old age of the earth. Tim Keller wrote, there is no logical reason to preclude that God could have used evolution to predispose people to believe in God in general so that people would be able to consider true belief when they hear the gospel preached. This is just one of many places where the supposed incompatibility of orthodox faith with evolution begins to fade away under more sustained reflection. What will it take to help Christian laypeople see greater coherence between what science tells us about creation and what the Bible teaches us about it? I'm not going to re-preach Tim Keller's paragraph here, but he essentially says God used evolution to make the gospel understandable. Tragic. For many evangelical Christians today, to take Genesis 1 at face value is something like believing in a flat earth, a rigid adherence to some out-of-date scientific theory based on faulty interpretations, faulty interpretations of the rocks and the Bible. Many Christians would tell us that our interpretation of the Bible needs to conform to the facts of science. But what if we ask the Bible? How much space is there in the Bible's record for current scientific consensus about the age of the earth and the mechanisms that gave us the world we live in? Is there wiggle room in Genesis for long geologic ages or vast astronomical time or evolutionary development of biological forms? This morning, I want to explore together why Genesis matters. What is at stake in taking Genesis at face value as an accurate historical record? And I would tell you up front that what is at stake is your view of God, your view of the Bible, your view of salvation, and your view of coming judgment. All of those hang on a literal reading of Genesis as history. And I will say this up front as well. You, you, you can't say, well, I love God, I love the Bible, I love the gospel, 
But I, I disagree with God's personal testimony about creation. You see, all of those things fall apart. Your theology proper falls apart. Your bibliology falls apart. Your soteriology falls apart and your eschatology falls apart when we disagree with God in the opening pages of his own record. So this morning, I want to give you four reasons that taking Genesis at face value matters. And there are many more than we could list here the morning, this morning. I will just give you these four. The first is theological. This is about God. You see, God has predicated his own identity on the fact of his creatorship. How many times in scripture do we see God say, I am the maker of heaven and earth, therefore? We need to survey that a little bit this morning, and, and we will only get a thumbnail glance at this. I would encourage you at some point when you start your Bible reading plan for the year, or whatever you do, however you make your way through the scriptures, just tuck away this little question. Where does God identify himself as creator, as maker? And what does he himself tie this to? And you're going to see it all over your Bible. You can't get away from it. You see, naturalism says the universe did it by itself over billions of years. Deistic evolution or some sort of theistic evolution says that God created everything, but he used evolution to do it. And what is God's own testimony? That he did it all by himself in a week. That's God's testimony. Of course, there was only one eyewitness to the events of creation, only one person there to report it to us, and he has told us what happened. And of course, it's not surprising that people who reject God also reject creationism. And there's a moral imperative to do that. If, if you don't want an indictment, if you don't want to be personally accountable to God for what you think, say, and do in every motive of the heart, then you have to do away with this idea of God altogether. There's got to be some other explanation for why we're here. I do find it surprising, however, that Bible reading Christians tend to be swayed by the scientific consensus. And I was one of those. Perhaps you were one of those. We understand from Romans 1 that God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. That is, God's identity, his power, his purpose, his attributes are predicated on his being the creator. I just want to lay out some for, for you some of the things that God identifies with his creatorship that have import on theology proper, how we think about God. So buckle your seatbelts. You can listen to these references. You can turn to them if you're really, really fast. Um, but let's talk first of all about ownership. By right of creation, God owns. What he makes out of nothing is his. And by the way, just the, the Hebrew word for create in Genesis is the word bara. Nobody baras except Elohim, Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Human beings refashion things out of what God has made, but, but only God baras. That Hebrew word is predicated on God's active creation out of nothing and, and his work alone in that. And when God creates, he therefore owns. Genesis 14, 19. God blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. God is the possessor of heaven and earth. Deuteronomy 10, 14 says, Behold, to Yahweh our God belong the heavens and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. And I think the implication there in Deuteronomy 10, where God then goes on to command his people, circumcise your hearts, is if the universe belongs to God, how much more should my heart belong to Yahweh? How much more should my entire life belong to him? Willingly, for my own desires. We are obligated by God's creatorship to be owned by him. Listen to Psalm 100, verses 1 to 3. Shout joyfully to Yahweh all the earth. Listen, all the earth is obligated this way. Serve Yahweh with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that Yahweh himself is God. It is he who made us not we ourselves, and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. God creates, therefore he owns. Next we see God's power. God's power is predicated on his creatorship. Jeremiah thirty-two seventeen. Ah, Yahweh God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Do you understand the correlation? If God can speak everything out of nothing by sheer fiat, 
by his word, speaking it into existence, he can take care of his people. This theology gets very practical very quickly. Think about God's provision for Samuel 2.8. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are Yahweh's and he set the world on them. God is the creator and sustainer of all things. Therefore, he meets the needs of his people in due time. He is a provider. And that provision of God is predicated on his creatorship. Next, we see God's kingship or his sovereignty, his right to rule. 2 Kings 19.15, Hezekiah prayed before Yahweh and said, O Yahweh, God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. God is king. God is king by right of his creatorship. He is sovereign by right of his creatorship. He made everything. He owns everything. He gets to tell everything what to do. Next, we see God's uniqueness or his solitariness. Uh, older theologians call this God's aseity, his otherness. First Chronicles 16.26 and Psalm 96.5 both say the same thing. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, and idols are nothings, but Yahweh made the heavens. We understand that God is not like any other so-called gods. There is only one God, and the definition of God is he who made the heavens and the earth. Everything else is a phony and a fake. God's universality. And what I mean by universality is uh, he is the one true God, and there aren't other gods in other places. There are no regional deities. God is not simply the God of Israel, and, and other countries get to have their gods. Uh, God is not America's God, and other countries have their religions. By universality, we mean that Yahweh is the one true God over all nations, over all peoples. Isaiah 44, 24. Thus says Yahweh, your Redeemer, the one who formed you from the womb, I, Yahweh, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself, spreading out the earth all alone. That is, he, he isn't just the little God of a little region. He is the sovereign over all places. He's the one that invented the idea of place. Acts 4.24, when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And in Acts 14.15, Paul and Barnabas were beginning to be worshipped as little gods. And they cried out, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of the same nature as you, and we preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In Acts 17, 24, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't dwell in temples made by hands, nor is he served by human hands as if he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people all people everywhere, life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the faces of the earth, having determined their appointed times and their boundaries of habitation. We learn also that God is jealous. If he is unique and the only and the universal one true God, then he is rightly and appropriately jealous of that as his identity. Isaiah 42, 5, thus says God, Yahweh, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and the spirit to those who walk in it. I am Yahweh, verse 8, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. I will not surrender it to graven images. There is one God who made everything, and he cannot, should not tolerate any rivals. He has no rivals, no peers. We learn also related to God's creation, his covenant promises. That is, God has made unilateral promises to be in relationship with his people. Second Chronicles 2.12. Purim continued and said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, who has made heaven and earth, who has given King David a wise son, endowed with discretion and understanding, who will build a house for Yahweh and a royal palace for himself. Here is a foreign king affirming the Davidic covenant of God's special relationship to his people Israel, all predicated on the fact that God is the only God and the creator of heaven and earth. 
He is also the provider of life, Nehemiah 9.6. You alone are Yahweh. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bow down, bows down before you. We learn also that God is worthy of worship, Revelation 4.11. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. And God is worthy of fear, Psalm 33. By the word of Yahweh, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear Yahweh. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. And you think of all those potter and clay passages. Who will talk back to the one who made him? Why did you make me this way? What would, be, what would it be like to stand in the presence of your maker this moment and recognize, he made me. And listen, everyone will. Everyone will. God is worthy of trust as creator, 1 Peter 4.19. Therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Do you notice how God's identity as creator is brought forward to comfort his people in suffering? That's a significant relationship. The God who can call everything out of nothing is certainly the one who can care for his creatures. God's ability to help is on display in this. Psalm 146, 5. How blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is Yahweh, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. Isaiah 40, verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. But why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from Yahweh, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. Isaiah 51, you have forgotten Yahweh, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundation of the earth. You fear the oppressor instead. We also see in this God's readiness to judge. Proverbs 14 says, He who oppresses the poor taunts his maker. You understand, you sin horizontally against other humans, and you have to answer not to the human horizontally in the end, not to some human court in the end, but you have to answer to that offended person's maker. Proverbs 17, 5, He who mocks the poor taunts his maker, he who rejoices at calamity will not go unpunished. In Revelation 14, 7, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. God is ready to judge, tied to his creatorship of all things. We learn of God's immensity. I love this in Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Who has marked off the heavens by the span? Who has calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed out the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Rhetorical questions. All of them designed for us to get a grasp on the immensity of God. We've already heard that God is the one who stretched out the heavens. Have you ever wondered, why is the universe so big if we live on this teeny tiny little speck? Why are the stars so far away? And if the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second, well, you can, you can ask Dr. Thomas this evening about the distant starlight and the age of the universe and all that stuff. Why is the universe so big? Perhaps so that God can say he holds it all in his hand. He's bigger than all of it. And he loves his people. This is practical theology. We learn as well that God is Trinitarian by his creative work. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God, we read that earlier, Genesis 1.2, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. We learn in John 1, 
in the beginning was the Word. We find out the Word is the one who became flesh in John 1.15, so that's Christ. The Christ was with God, and the Christ was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from Jesus the Christ, nothing came into being that has come into being. So who created the universe? God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son. God in Trinitarian orchestration brought everything out of nothing. You see, in your Bible, you just can't get away from the reality that God identifies himself as the one who made everything all by himself. He stakes his own identity on these realities. You cannot deny them in Genesis and expect your theology to hold together in the rest of your Bible. This is doxological. We are impelled by these things to worship God, to be humble before Him, to revere Him in awe and fear, and these things are very practical. We are to get near to this great and awesome and terrible and mighty God because He loves His children. This is the kind of terrifying, awful bigness that draws us close magnetically because He is so wonderful. And all of these realities obligate us to be humble, to fear God, to turn to God from idols, to turn to God from our sins, to find favor with God by coming to Him in faith through His Son, Jesus Christ. Creation matters for your theology. Let me give you a second reason Genesis matters. For your bibliology, the Bible. We have up there on the screen for you a chart detailing six spectacular days. Don't squint. It, it's way too small for you to see it. You can see the boxes and some of the connections. I put this diagram up on the website, on the outline portion on the website, so you can go look at it later. Um, but what I want you to see in this chart, in the top three boxes represent days one, two, and three. That is God forming static environments. This is where God says, light be, and light that did not exist, obeyed the voice of God by coming into existence. Land, be, vegetation, sprout. These are uh, areas and realms that God forms. Prior to this, it was formless and void. And, and God separates out things and makes distinctions and areas. And then the last three boxes represent days four, five, and six, where God fills what he forms. He fills the expanses with lights and movable objects, and then he fills the sky with birds and the, the sea with teeming things and water creatures, and then he fills the land with land creatures, and finally, man and woman, humanity made in his own image. What's remarkable about the Genesis account in Genesis 1 is its detail and its order. It is exquisite. And we understand from Hebrews 11.3, that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Psalm 148.5 says, He commanded and they were created. You see, Genesis 1 actually tells us how God made it. It's not enough for us to say, well, the Bible just means to tell us that God made it. It doesn't tell us how, why, or when. Actually, no, the Bible tells us how, why, and when. The, the details given to us in Genesis 1 and 2 on the, on the creation of the universe in six days and then the zoomed-in view of what God did in his creation of man and woman. God tells us how he made it. It was instantaneous creation by speech. He tells us throughout Scripture, and I counted half a dozen times where God says he stretched out the heavens. God did this with his own power. And the Bible tells us why God made it. Listen to Isaiah 45, 18. God created the universe not to be a waste place, but for it to be inhabited. That is purposeful. And then the Bible tells us when God made it. When was that? We have a timestamp right there in the first words of your Bible. In the beginning. You say, well, that's great. I knew that already. <laughs> but when was that? <laughs> what was the date? Listen to Mark 10, 6. From the beginning of creation, God made humans male and female. Did you ever notice that? I thought that was about marriage. Yeah, um, listen, <laughs> from the beginning of creation, wh whatever the time stamp is on beginning, that's when God made man and woman. God made man and woman at the beginning. Listen, this is significant. This is the Bible's own testimony about when 
According to the Bible, when was man created? 20 billion years after the Big Bang? 4.5 billion years after the earth was formed? Hundreds of millions of years after some biotic swamp soup? No, the first week. The first week. And listen, I, I, I know what it's like to live in the world we live in and swim upstream believing the Bible at face value. To, to get laughed out of a laboratory by those in white laboratory coats because you're a kook for believing in a young earth. This is tough, and, and people get tripped up thinking that the universe seems old. Have you ever heard this argument? Why would God lie? Why would he make a universe that looks so old if the Bible tells us it's not that old? Uh, maybe you've thought that. I, I would just tell you that a universe that seems old, an earth appears old, rocks that look old, fossils of extinct animals, they must be old. The, the reality in all of that is that no one has ever yet been in an old universe to even know what an old universe looks like. No one has ever yet seen old rocks to know what they would look like. No one has ever seen billions and billions of years of history to know what it looks like. So it's a faulty comparison from the start. For many evangelical Christians today, to take Genesis 1 at face value, to believe in a young universe is, again, like believing in a, a flat earth some sort of out-of-time, unscientific view. But when we come to the book of Genesis, we get Genesis presented as real literal history. And we might ask for a moment this morning, what kind of literature is Genesis? Is it possible to read the, the account of Genesis 1 not as history? Maybe you've considered genre and literary forms before. Different literature has different purposes, and they are written in different forms. And there are clues in the literature to indicate this. If I said, once upon a time, what kind of literature is that? It's a fairy tale. If I said, knock, knock, with that tone, you know that's a joke, probably a bad one. If I said, to whom it may concern, you think, well... Uh, this is some sort of business letter, formal transaction, or am I in trouble? If you heard at the top of our broadcast tonight, we turn to the tsunami in Japan. That's a newscast, right? There, there are introductory formula that tell us what kind of literature it is. There are features embedded in literature that tell us what kind of literature something is. And competent hearers or readers understand those clues embedded in communication forms that help them to interpret the information that's coming. Do I take it seriously? Am I preparing to laugh? Am I being audited? Is this fictional? Is it news? How should I hear it? And we listen for those clues. So literary analysts turn their attention to the first chapter of Genesis, and they ask those questions. What kind of literature is this? How should we read it? Are there clues that tell us what kind of literature it is? And I would contend for you this morning that Genesis is, in fact, historical narrative. But other suggestions have been given. Myth. Mythic history, saga, parable, salvation history, typology, legend, hero story, exalted prose, hymn, temple literature, poetry, and I kind of like the one mythopoetic. That sounds really academic. And amongst all of those views, aside from the historical view, if you take a non-historical view of Genesis, there's very little consensus in the literary analysts. They're all competing for their various views. And it just makes you weary and wary of someone saying, it doesn't mean what it says, it means something else, and you need to believe me and my theory about what this literature is actually doing. The one genre that gets a lot of airtime in Christian circles is poetic. So maybe for just a moment, by way of example, we'll talk about, is Genesis 1 poetry? And, and just, you know, if you're looking at your English text, I, I grant this is a, a printer's formatting issue, but if you go out on the Bible wall in the, in the back hallway, you'll see the same thing. There are indentions where there is poetry, and there are straight block paragraphs where you have narration. And here in your English Bibles, you just have straight block paragraphs. That is identifying the lack of rhythmic features that identify Hebrew poetry. It also lacks the parallelism that is all over Hebrew poetry. The grammar and the verb forms here are of narrative form. They are not poetical forms. There is imagery and metaphor in poetry. The, the imagery and metaphor are lacking here. And if you want to jot down an example where you can see the same narration told by historical um, uh, as a historical narrative, and then as a song, write down Judges 4 and 5. 
Judges chapter 4 gives the historical narrative version of a battle, and Judges chapter 5 gives the song of Deborah and Barak as they sing about what happened. And you can see the differences. Even in the English, you can see the differences in the, the rhythmic layout of the literature, and you can see things like literary devices, metaphors, simile, word pictures. It's very easy to tell the difference between poetry and historical narrative. If you want to see a poetic version of creation, as a contrast to the historical narrative of Genesis 1, just turn to Psalm 104, and you can read the creation account in poetry. It looks and sounds different. There are metaphors and similes and dramatic imagery and other literary devices there, and you can see them in your English text. By the way, even if Genesis were portrayed in poetry, does this keep us from examining the details? Oh, it's a poem. Don't look too closely. No, Jesus quoted from poems in the Psalms, and he builds a case on theological details from grammatical features in poetry. That would still be problematic. But you need to know that this is historical narrative by every accounting. In fact, the, the, um, the, our friends at ICR put together the Rape Project. That's the Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth. And it's a thick, heavy, two-volume book. I literally own no heavier two-volume set of books than these two books. I don't know what kind of paper they printed on. It's probably Paleolithic paper or something. Is it made of rocks or something? And... Um, and in that book is a remarkable chapter. You wouldn't necessarily know to find it. There is a statistical analysis of Hebrew grammar of Genesis 1 in this book on radioisotopes. And I would commend to you that chapter. You can also find it in Terry Mortensen's book, Coming to Grips with Genesis, which is available at our book table. And it just works through all the grammatical features, even available to an English reader, that you could understand why the Hebrew is so crystal clear. Any Hebraist worth their salt reading Genesis 1 and telling you it's anything other than historical narrative is not speaking the truth. It is objective, statistically verifi verifiable reality that Hebrew or that uh, Genesis 1 and 2 is historical narrative. This construction of, of, of the way the Hebrew is built there is fundamental to Hebrew narrative. It's how Hebrew tells a story, a, a sequence of events, one thing after another in order. And it's exactly what's happening in Genesis 1. And we don't have time to look into the literary framework view that details Genesis 1 as non-sequential. Um, I don't believe that God is trying to give you secret messages that only a 21st century linguist would pick up on the, the subtleties of some literary framework to tell you, don't read it for the details. In fact, I think Genesis screams just the opposite. Read this and pay attention to the details. We don't have time to go into uh, supposed gaps between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, uh, in some way to insert millions and billions of years in there. Um, we won't ha take the time today to talk about the Hebrew word yom and why it always shows up in, in, uh, as a 24-hour period when tied to numerals. Uh, those are all uh, really good things to think through. What you need to understand is people are always trying to embed long ages into the Genesis account, and Genesis won't let you do it. The author won't let you do it. By the way, when you read the Bible, you should be reading as if the author of this book were looking over your shoulder and asking you, how are you reading this? which means we should always read vertically. God, I'm paying attention to you because you're speaking to me in your word. And we need to take his word seriously. There is no smuggling of long ages into this historical account. I'm afraid that many attempts to analyze the genre or the literary style of Genesis 1 are a guise for ignoring the details of the text. And I believe, frankly, this is because many evangelicals are embarrassed by a literalistic approach to Genesis. To read Genesis as poetry or parable or some other form allows them to talk about theological themes without bearing the shame of believing what the world thinks is a fairy tale. I believe that Christians in academic, scientific, scholarly circles face enormous pressure to not look silly. Do you remember junior high school? I don't think we ever grow out of that. And frankly, right now, claiming that the world is 6,000 years old, that God created everything in six 24-hour days, sounds silly to people who have been told all of their lives that science has proven a 4.5 billion year old Earth and a 20 billion year old universe. 
some again would claim that we just need to allow Genesis 1 to point us to the reality, to the big idea. God created everything. That's enough for me. It's a theological portrait. You, you don't zoom in on the pixels. It's not cosmological or cosmogenical details. Does that sound right to you? It doesn't matter how long he did it. It doesn't matter how he did it. I mean, the text actually says that God did it in the beginning, that he did it over six days, and that he did it by speaking things into existence that didn't exist in an orderly sequence. What if God actually wanted to make a point about how he did everything and how long it took him? How else might he have described it? It seems to me that a plain reading of this chapter, that God wanted to communicate to us how he made everything. We should get the big idea of the passage. God created we should also get the details. He gave this to us for a reason. When you go outside of Genesis, we could ask the question, how is Genesis presented in the rest of the Bible? Listen to Exodus 20. Uh, the rest of the Bible treats Genesis as historical narrative. God, giving the Ten Commandments, explaining the Sabbath to the Israelites, says, For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And you go obey the Sabbath day. If days are long ages, the Sabbath means nothing. The Ten Commandments fall apart. God saw Genesis as history in Exodus 20. Jesus' words in Matthew 19 and Mark 10 both affirm that Genesis' account of creation as a historical event. Jesus treated Adam and Eve as real people and the events of the creation and fall as a real historical event. The argument in Romans 5 of the correlation between Adam and the second Adam, that is Christ our Savior, falls apart if Adam is not a historical figure and the fall a historical event. And Paul affirms in 1 Timothy 2, 13 and 14 that Adam and Eve were indeed historical figures, not mythical representatives of an evolved race. Additionally, throughout the Bible, creation is presented as a past historical event, not something that keeps on going by some process. And if you believe in an evolutionary process, then we're still in it, and you wouldn't speak of creation as the past. In the Bible, the creation is always a past event. If we don't believe God's own testimony to creation in the opening pages of our Bibles, tell me, where do we start believing? Do you start believing in chapter 12, chapter 15? Where does the Bible start to get good, i.e. truthful? If we don't believe the testimony the rest of the Bible gives to the veracity of the opening pages, then we don't really have a Bible at all. What you believe about the testimony of Genesis makes a difference in what you believe about the Bible. The Bible itself is at stake. Is the Bible trustworthy? Is this God's breathed out word, and is it therefore accurate in everything it portrays? Is it sufficient to present to us both earthly and spiritual truth? God, by the way, is the only objective historian. He's the only eyewitness to the origins of the universe. Why would we subvert God's own testimony to the fallible, biased, antagonistic, mental meanderings of fallen man? This is a who-are-we-going-to-trust game. One author put it this way. The intellectual ground of natural man is a fictitious cosmos in which all truth is first responsible to him, that is, to the sanctity of his own private judgment, before he is responsible to the truth. Any God which might exist, therefore, by virtue of his mightness, must subject himself to man for verification. But the Almighty God cannot be known in such fiction. The right of verification from a stance outside and therefore over the word of God, of verification from the standpoint of one's own resources, is not common ground. It's not neutral ground. It is fallen ground. That belongs to man's fanciful independence and futile attempt to serve as his own reference point. That's exactly right. That points at the problem. Jesus said this in John 3.19. Men loved darkness rather than light, therefore their deeds were evil. That's God's present judgment. That God made known about himself to every human on the face of the earth, Romans 1, but men suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. There's no objectivity in a white laboratory coat. There's nothing that makes you unbiased when you look through a microscope or a telescope. Every man comes with his presuppositions, with his commitments, 
and as slaves of sin by nature and by birth, as sinners by activity out of that nature, to what are we predisposed? To love ourselves and not submit ourselves to the lordship of the God of the universe. Let me give you a third reason this morning why Genesis matters. And this is soteriological. That is, it is about salvation. This is why we can't say, well, I love the gospel, but I'm not ready to believe everything God said. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians 4, we get this remarkable statement about the state of the world around us. And we've been in this chapter recently. We remember that the Apostle Paul here is encouraging the Corinthian believers to look not at the outward appearances, to look not at what is seen, what, what can be perceived with human perception, but to look to the truth. And so he's describing why it is that so many people don't believe and what the barriers to belief actually are. He says, beginning in verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 4, if our gospel is veiled, and it is, then it is veiled to those who are perishing. In other words, those who don't believe the gospel don't believe the gospel. Those who are perishing, those who are lost, they don't see it yet. And here's the explanation, verse 4. In whose case the God of this world, notice small g God. Paul here is talking about Satan. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Look, the answer to everything is knowing God through Jesus Christ, who is his image. And that comes through the gospel. The, the good news that Jesus Christ came to the earth to save sinners by going to a cross to actually pay for the sins of everyone who would ever believe, past, present, and future. To, to wipe the slate clean between sinful man and a holy God so that man could be qualified to be in God's presence and enjoy the outshining radiance of his glory rather than being incinerated by it. This is the good news of the gospel. Qualification to be with God. And this light of this gospel, the, the enlightening of the gospel, it is obscured. How? By the God of this world, blinding the minds of unbelieving. This is remarkable. How, how would one overcome satanic blinding to gospel light? What's required? If I'm wandering around in the darkness, and I'm following other people who are wandering around in the darkness, all of them saying, I know the way, I know the way, I know the way, and nobody's going the same direction. And by the way, they've they all have blindfolds over their eyes and their eyeballs are plucked out and their optic nerves have disintegrated and the lights are shut out and the light bulbs are broken and the breakers are tripped and the power's out at the power station. I mean, there is no light, absolute darkness to spiritual things. How are any of those blind people going to remedy their situation? How do you overcome this kind of blinding. By the way, satanic blinding is not the only issue at stake. Outside of 2 Corinthians 4, we also understand the hardness of the human heart keeps people from believing the gospel. We also know that the pressure of the world, that junior high peer pressure, everybody's going the same path, that must be right. Many who are on the path to destruction. Satanic blinding, hard human heart, peer pressure of the world. And there's a fourth obstacle to belief. It is divine judicial hardening. We see this over and over and over again in Scripture, uh, very clearly in Romans 1, because they rejected God's truth. They suppressed his truth of his creatorship in unrighteousness. God gave them over to further darkness and depravity. And when they loved that stuff, he gave them over more fully to that depravity. And man became insane Insanely immoral, 
corrupt in all their behavior and you have this domino effect of divine judgment where god says you want more darkness i'll give you more darkness you want more immorality i'll give you more immorality that is judicial hardening it is a judgment (laughs) how do you overcome a hard human heart and the world's pressure against the truth and satanic blinding and divine judicial hardening my friends there is only one answer it's found in verse 6 2 Corinthians 4, God who said, light be. Do you remember that moment? Of course, no, none of us were there. Only God was the eyewitness to this moment when he said, light be. And light that did not exist obeyed the voice of God by coming into existence. This is sheer power. This is fiat creationism of an unbelievable proportion. We don't know what it's like to create out of nothing. This is why nobody baraz but Elohim. God, the one true God, creates out of nothing. And, and that is exactly what is needed in salvation. Notice the second half of verse 6. God, the one who said light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. We needed that light of the gospel. We needed to know God. We needed to be in his, the presence of his glory, qualified to be there rather than be destroyed by it. And we only get that through Christ. What brings it about? The God who created light, called it into being out of nothing, is the one who shines in our hearts the light of the gospel so that we have his glory in the face of Christ. Listen. We have a creator with redemptive purpose. And that's a good thing after the fall. That God didn't leave us to death through one man's sin into the world and and, uh, death through sin. We could have just all been left there at spiritual deadness forever. But our creator had redemptive purpose. And then we discover here in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 and 6 that our redeemer has creative power. He is able to call out of nothing that which is required by his holiness and his justice. So the man with the withered hand, Jesus says, stretch it out. Why? To the lame man, Jesus says, walk. And he picks up his pallet and starts dancing around. To Lazarus, the dead man in the tomb, dead four days. Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And a dead man who had zero ability to obey the voice of Christ obeys the voice of Christ because in the command of Christ is the very power of Christ for the dead to live. Just like light came out of nothing into existence, spiritual life comes out of nothing by God's creative act, ex nihilo, fiat, grace. Look, you mess with creation, you mess with soteriology. Number four, eschatology. Why why does Genesis matter? Because the end. Because the end. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. I'll just read it, and I'll give you one summary statement. 2 Peter 3, beginning in verse 3. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For ever ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded by water, Second Peter won't let you make Noah's flood be some regional little puddle. But by his word, verse 7, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So what you do with Genesis matters in what you do with coming judgment. Last time by water, next time by fire. We were standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon. Great 
big hole in the ground, beautiful, just magnificent. The colors, as we were there, the clouds came and went, and we were there early morning hiking down, and the, the sun kept changing, the, the, the rays coming through clouds, and the colors kept changing. If you, if all of you who were there and you took pictures, you have as many different pictures as there were minutes you spent in the, can, in the canyon. Because everything kept changing, just beautiful and magnificent. And, and I mentioned this on, on Saturday morning, or Saturday? Was yesterday Saturday? I mentioned this on Saturday morning. Um, that, that there's a plaque there at the rim with Psalm 19 on it. The heavens are declaring the glory of God. And, and that plaque is good and biblical and accurate, although I don't think it's the right label for the Grand Canyon. That's not about the creative processes in the, in the week of creation. That hole in the ground exists because God hates sin and he judged the world for sin. And all those layers of rocks that you can see with your very eyes are there because God scoured the continents with water and deposited all of those sedimentary layers. And then God ran a channel of water and cut it out and exposed all those layers. Why? So we could see them. Uh, they were there, but, but now we get to see them and, and we get to see what those rocks say. And what do they say? God hates sin. Last time by water, next time by fire. And so we ought to say that every time you fill up in your car, put gas in the tank, why can I put gas in my car? Because God buried a massive biomass under temperatures and pressures, creating petroleum products so that we could drive around. Put gas in your car. Why am I doing this again? Oh yeah, God hates sin. Next time by fire. Listen, God loves to save sinners. You're in this room because you are a direct descendant of eight people saved, preserved in a box floating on the waters. You are evidence that God saved sinners. Noah and his family deserved to die in the flood and God saved them by his grace. They clung to him in faith. Listen, you have an opportunity this morning. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, you need to be right with your maker. And the maker of the universe, as man for man, was made a curse. The claims of law which he had made unto the uttermost, he paid. His holy fingers made the bow that crowned the thorns upon his brow. Our maker came to earth as our Redeemer. If you don't know him, you can have your sins forgiven today by placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't do that, you will meet him one day, accountable for all that you are and all that you've done. Listen, I know it's tough to have a worldview switch if you're here this morning and experiencing something of a crisis. Man, that guy just talked for a long time and made evolution look silly. I don't know if I succeeded in making evolution look silly. I hope what you saw is the Bible's clear testimony about what the Bible says about origins. That may produce in your own heart some sort of conflict. Listen, most of us in this room have been in that conflict at some point or another. Our friends at Institute for Creation Research have brought a lot of helpful resources to stay your heart, to help you know that believing the Bible is not stupid. Number one, we, we believe what God says because he can forgive my sin. Oh. Of course he can make the world out of nothing in six days. He's going to make a new heavens and a new earth like that. You mean I can just believe God's word? And, and maybe I don't have to look silly in the laboratory? No, read those books. You won't look silly in the laboratory. Listen, to be a Christian means to embrace the foolishness. That is to embrace what the world deems foolish. Preaching's foolish. God says there's a foolishness about standing up in front of people and proclaiming truth, and yet it is his power and his wisdom. The gospel itself is foolish and a scandal, and yet God says that's where I've located my power and my wisdom. And listen, believing in a young earth and a biblical model of creation is in the world's eyes a foolishness, and we embrace it, Christian. Why? Because it is actually God's power and God's exquisite wisdom on display. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, this refreshing reminder from your word that you are the maker of all things. By your great power, all these things have been made. 
we agree with John Calvin who said it is vain for any to reason as philosophers on the workmanship of the world except those who having first been humbled by the preaching of the gospel have learned to submit the whole of their intellectual wisdom to the foolishness of the cross. We do that, O Lord. We just submit our puny brains to your infinite wisdom and we trust you. In Jesus' name.